um yeah how was this was this uh, useful to you because you were it, quite keen to uh... it was very useful in understanding that it didn't do what i expected it to do um <laughs> that was actually the funniest part of this whole whole endeavor so um federica had posted about our uh, version control uh, chapter into um, the uh, repository and then um, I was explaining that I, I have a little bit of anxiety about this particular topic only because it still didn't work. Everything that I tried, everything that I attempted still didn't yeah. work. Um, I do have some successful points or some lessons learned that I'd like mm -hmm. to share uh, today, but the, as far as um, being able to show you that I can deploy something. It didn't work the way I had intended. So, um, well, let's talk about this and, and yeah, but that's see good where to um, good to know because you know, I mean, uh, with that we can kind of, um, I mean, we may be able to help you, but uh, like Agreed. where your expectations don't match with how the the the, the tool works, it's it could be quite interesting to to know that um, what I. What I find in these type of experiences, and this is for anybody that may watch the video at a later point, whenever I, I run into this scenario of, well, there's not really much forum posts about it. There's nobody that's actually doing this particular step. Uh, mm. The tool itself doesn't deploy you know, as, as intended. Um, usually this implies that either A, I'm the first person that's ever tried this, which I highly doubt. And then the second is I'm just not going about it the right way. And there's probably <laughs> a more optimal form that I haven't discovered. So that's ultimately where I usually uh, split uh, between uh, reevaluating how I'm approaching the subject. So at any rate, if it's okay, I'm going to share my screen. Yeah, and yeah, of course, of course. So I I'll just tell both of you, I have not actually put together presentation material for this. I was planning on it yeah. being more interactive, okay, uh, okay, uh, working through this process and, and showing you uh, how exactly I've, I've come up with this scenario. So let me, uh, let me share screens and I'm gonna try to share my full desktop because the service, I'm gonna be going back and forth between terminal and also the uh, sure. web browser itself. So let's go with share desktop two and hit share. And let me know when you've got the deploy your application window open. Yes, I can see your browser. Okay, perfect, uh, perfect. Yeah. That'll work. So I'm on chapter 13, deploying your application. This is the, the topic of coverage today. Um, one of the, the obviously learning objectives that we always try and convey uh, for the community is how to deploy your app or what best practice, what steps, what path would you use to deploy your app? And that's what this whole chapter is, is discussing. I really did like the first comment right out of the, uh, the first line of the paragraph or first line of the chapter. <clears throat> your deployments should be as boring, straightforward, and stress-free as possible. And in theory, that would be how we would want as a engineer or a, or a DevOps sysadmin or, or some form of, of data scientist. If you're going to deploy something, you want it to be as almost nearly pain-free as possible. You don't want to run into any errors. Um, and so that's where the comment of my lessons learned came from. Um, once your app is built, you're ready to deploy it. So we're going to go through some checklists here and I'm going to run these with us. Uh, so you can see that uh, I do have an active working Golem package. Uh, mm. It's not something I developed, but it was, uh, I, I borrowed it from Colin and, and gave uh, retribution back to him or citation back to him uh, for this particular app. So the, the one first check is to do a dev tools check call. <clears throat> this is in the third grouping of the, of the dev portion of Golem. So I'm going to stop for a second and switch back over to our studio and move this. Actually, you know what? I'm going to leave it in the browser and I'm going to go to, let me see if I can get this out of the way. Let's go over to the web version of our studio. So I've mentioned this in the past. Um, while I was going through this quest of Shiny and, and, and just working through multiple operating systems, I decided to be agnostic and, and just create my own RStudio web interface. Now, I can come from Windows, from Mac, or from Linux and still have the same environment because mm -hmm. it's on the web. There are some drawbacks to it, especially when it comes to package management. Um, the web version does have some nuances that you have to be aware of especially if you're trying to deploy a shiny application, 
because the web won't let you do that. The web version won't let you do that. It'll actually block you. Um, so a regular R Studio environment will also be uh, a possibility if you want to test it locally, uh, create that web server in the background. At any rate, what I wanted to show is under the, the section three deployment R portion of Golem, there is a particular line that has DevTools check. Now the first lessons learned uh, Russ and Federico when I was going through this was I didn't realize the way you wanted to process these files, these one, two, and three files. I created the Golex uh, app. I was playing around with that and I didn't really quite grasp or understand with it until I really started getting my hands dirty. What you wanna do with these uh, first section, second section, and third section files, these are files, you actually run the commands. So you put your cursor on a particular line and yeah. just hit execute. Rather than source the whole... Exactly. Script. Yeah. So there's a lot of automation in the background that just does things based on the package management. And so that was a, a, my first discovery. But let's go ahead and just run this dev tools check. Now, this particular package was a example that Colin had put together on his GitLab, uh, GitHub uh, repo. Uh, and it, I extracted just this one example because it was functional and it worked. Um, unfortunately, I couldn't get to the stage of actually deploying it because there's some nuance that I'm gonna talk about here in a second. Let's do this dev check and uh, we'll see what errors we get. Now this dev check, <clears throat> as it, pro let me pull this up. As it processes, what we're doing is doing all of the previous chapters uh, of discussion, whether it be the test that, uh, all of your uh, YAML file validation uh, vignettes, et cetera. It's checking all the documentation. We're going to get a couple of warnings in one note here, um, all of which aren't that important in the sense of deployment. There are errors that you wanna take a close look at, but it's not something that would stop you from deployment. Yeah. Um, so for example, uh, I'm just gonna highlight this line here. Uh, this is a warning and I know it's purple on black, so that's gonna be a little hard to see, but what it's saying is there's a non-standard license specification. So I didn't run that licensing feature. So it doesn't know what type of, of distribution, open source distribution to use or what license to use. Um, again, that's just a warning, but it's not important. I did find the second warning here with the dot dot, or sorry, colon, colon, and then the three colons. There's a, uh, a change in, uh, I think it's our package or it's, there's one of the underlying libraries or packages that are used for Golem that gives a, uh, a particular warning. The, the process is going to be deprecated eventually. So um, I think with it being DT, I have reason to believe that that's data table and that might be some form of a call maybe, but. No, that's, uh, awesome. sorry, that's, um, um, it's like for, front-end formatting of, t of tables. It's not the data table. I see. Um, uh, kind of, you know, like the table manipulation thing that uh, oh, sorry, it probably sounds a weird thing to say. Um, yeah, DT is, it's used um, in a lot of shiny apps. Um, okay. It's for kind of, um, I wonder what it's actually based on. Oh yeah, sorry. Yes, sorry. The JavaScript library upon which it's based is called data tables, but there's a R package called data.table. Two um, different, two two different quite, services then. Uh, ah, things, okay. Yeah, so this is, yeah, it's, it, there'll be some call to a function okay. from within DT that um, hasn't been namespaced explicitly enough. The last one is just a note. And in my particular schema or, or uh, format of, of my RStudio, this black background, dark theme background, uh, the note block is, is in blue. Uh, and what it's telling us is that there are some global calls that aren't used or, or uh, not visible global functions. So we've got a couple of text lines that Colin had put in here that hadn't been explicitly called upon. So you get these, these notes saying, hey, there might be a problem in the future. It's not important at this moment. So as far as, as long as you don't have zero, or as long as, as, long as you don't have any errors, you're going to be able to deploy it and it'll work. 
the yeah. warnings and the notes are more for the development of kind of like log file uh, type details. Okay. So going back to the chapter, that was the first uh, dev tools check. Now the statement says you, you want to have zero errors, zero warnings and zero notes. That would be the best optimal way or pristine way of, of deployment. You know that the service is gonna work and there's not gonna be any errors with any, any user. Um, what we want to make sure is that the current version is valid. Uh, everything is fully documented, all of our different checkpoints, vignettes, et cetera. The test coverage is good. This particular uh, example uh, that I grabbed didn't really have any extensive testing features built into it. Um, I did, when I put this into GitLab, I did ask to use uh, the CI process, uh, constant innovation process. I did get a few emails uh, from the uh, repository to my uh, email address saying, hey, you've got some CI processes that aren't working. I'll show you that in a second. Um, I happen to use GitLab uh, for this, this uh, particular repository and I didn't see any errors in the pipeline of, of the CI process, but um, it's not saying that I don't have problems. It's just not working currently. <laughs> Um, everything in the project knows the person uh, to call if something goes wrong. In the very first entry of our Golem packaging process, there's a point where you want to put in the developer, the author of the package, and also the email address of the, of the person. So that is knowing who to call when something goes wrong or, you know, be able to send an email. Um, are everything, uh, is everything clear and uh, everyone involved in the project? Uh, is there any debugging process that hasn't been finished or any other merge conflicts or anything else that hasn't been resolved? Um, if it's relevant, the server is deployed and has all the necessary software installed. I wanna make a comment about this particular bullet. Um, when I generated this initial Golem package, there were, I think there was four packages that I didn't have installed on my web server. The process of actually updating those also called on doing a complete update of all of my packages. It took about a half an hour to 45 minutes to run all of these updates. This isn't a very strong server. It's not very powerful. Um, it, it is a very dated aged blade server from a, from a uh, consignment that I, I purchased. So it doesn't have the best of resources. So it did take quite a while for it to update. Um, the server has all system requirements needed, uh, including system libraries. Uh, and if you are deploying it on Docker, that it is at least Dockerized. Um, the application is deployed on a server will be deployed on a port, which will be access accessible by users. This comment is not really from a, uh, how do I say it? It's not from a user of R, okay, somebody that's developing it, it's actually your infrastructure. You wanna make sure that your IT department or if you are the IT department, that you've at least made that port available on your web server for others to access. You don't want them to have some obscure, weird uh, port identification. Uh, if relevant, the environment of envir environmental variables from the production server are managed inside the application and the app is launched in the correct port. The server where the app is deployed has access to the data resources, whether that be a database, an API, or some other form of, of a hook or, or link to another server. If the app records data, there are at least backups of these data. Okay. So now let's talk about sharing your application. This is actually where I started to run into difficulties with Golem. When you go to install the package, right? my current environment says, the RStudio web server and my Shiny server are actually the same machine. They're separated in the sense that in one service, I have the RStudio kernel running uh, or R kernel running, and then the other is just a web server with the Shiny package or Shiny uh, application. When you cross in between these two folders, there is no way to directly install the package on the web server and then deploy it. Okay. What the author, Colin, is speaking of here is the sense that I want to package this and deploy it to somebody else's computer. So if you uh, were to grab my GitLab repository and then clone that, you could literally do an install of that package just like you would on any other CRAN application or any other form of, of package management. So what we have is this remotes install local. This call 
is going to be to your RStudio environment or your RStudio package management. And then it loads all of the, the requirements based on the Golem package itself. So it's your dependencies, all of your libraries that are required to run this particular Shiny app. If you were in a different location, say you're not in your working directory, um, you can just do the remotes install and then put the path to where you have that library located. And then that'll do the installation process for you. Once you are installing the package and confirming that it's operational, you should get a restart of your R session and then it'll automatically call the library and then the package name, whatever it is that you're calling it. Okay. Once this is loaded, then you can just do a run app call and that'll automatically spin up the Shiny server local on your machine and then you can interact with it. So this is one way of deployment. I wanna just make sure that we know that there's multiple ways that you can share this particular package. This just happens to be a local service. Hmm. This did not fit my need for being able to deploy it on an RStudio server though, uh, excuse me, a shiny, uh, local shiny server. Right. Okay, so the next one is going to be, uh, we already talked about the local build, but what you can do is run this build call now, what's going to happen is it'll actually uh, call on the gzip uh, or, or GNU zip uh, function and create a tar gz file. Think of this as, as a compressed form that you can pass over to another user. And then if you were to deploy it from that point, obviously your, your uh, colleague or, or a person that's using this package would be able to uh, compile the binaries and, and actually install the package on their local machine as well. So again, it's just a second way only now I've got this, this zipped package that has everything contained within it, okay? Now, the third option is we can upload it to a particular repository. Now, I've never done this before. I've never used any sort of uh, services where I deploy kind of like a, a, a uh, I can't ever remember what the CRAN uh, acronym is, uh, but it's current R something. Um, it's application comprehensive. Comprehensive, the comprehensive that's the R archive. Um, that's it. I, I don't know what the N is, but when uh, when you network, yeah. network when you deploy it to those package management forms, R Studio as a IDE can reach out and and grab that repository and download the package directly. Um, you can change those options as well. Uh, whether like as an example, if you have DevTools installed, you can do a remote install and then just list the URL of where the GitHub or GitLab repository is located. It'll access that uh, service and then download it directly to your computer as well. Okay. Again, the third time that I'm saying this is, is we've went through three different ways of deployment, all of which didn't serve the needs that I was after. But then on the second point are viable ways that you can have another person install your package. So it's either local build, you just throw it over, lob it over mm -hmm. to them and they can do a local install. If you can do a, a build command, which will create that tar gz file, you can lob that over to them. Or this third option is, is if you are a developer and have been um, not qualified, what's the word I'm looking for, uh, incorporated into the, to the CRAN system, you can deploy it directly to uh, CRAN itself or any other uh, package management form. There was a service, uh, is it in this paragraph that I noted? Maybe it's further down. There is an RStudio package management server that you can deploy. I don't have that service built. Uh, so I didn't have that option as a, as a path. I may look at it as an option. Um, there's some funny story I have with some Docker registry things um, that uh, I'm dealing with as well. But that's another option is if you could create your own package management server and then just point your RStudio at it, it would download it directly from that point too. There are links in our, pair, uh, sorry, in our chapter that give uh, uh, some credence to using CRAN as a, as a service. Um, I would presume, I don't know this for a fact, so I'm probably being a little bit uh, pervasive here, but I would assume that that CRAN has some extremely regimented, rigid ways in which you're deploying the package. Um, there's a bunch of checklists that you have to make sure that are filled that are even beyond just Golem's package management form as well. Validation, test services, et cetera. Um, yeah, yeah. 
Russ, um, if you want to explain Yeah, yeah, that. there's there's considerable um, hurdles to jump over to get onto CRAM. Um, so, I mean, it, it, it starts with the R check thing that you used earlier on. So okay. in, with that, you should have, you know, um, no errors or warnings or notes just by um, just, you know, just as a given on your local machine. Then um, when you upload your code, um, it, what, sorry, before you upload your code to CRAN, you can submit it to, um, there's a, there's a, there's a web service that will uh, take your code and run it on various servers of different um, operating systems on, you know, Solaris oh, and on um, various forms of Ubuntu and Windows and whatnot. Okay. Um, in each case, checking that the the package runs without errors or anything like that. Then there's yeah. a, a, there's a few other things that get checked that that Cram will do, and and you know, and 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 only once you've got all that stuff done should you consider you know pestering the people at cran because yeah. they've got an awful lot of stuff to do but do um, yeah uh, so that it's i mean it, it, and they can be quite demanding um yeah. you know even once you've got all that you know because if if this if the thing that you've written is something that they've already got 20 packages that does that that they yeah. may kind of question the the value of having another thing that does the same thing um but yeah uh i've you... i've only done it for thing i've only deployed uh, sorry i've only submitted to cram on my own for a single package okay. but i've i'm an, an author on a, a a couple of others that like a um more established but yeah uh so what also happens is you know in a few months time um they they will rerun your package against the new versions of r as they're released and if anything starts to fail you'll get emails and they'll interesting okay tests of all things that depend upon your package and if any of them start to fail then they'll email no is that right something like that anyway um it's it, it's quite quite a demanding process but uh yeah anyway. i would feel i would think that with the sheer volume of our users that are in the world yeah they're validating that all of the various dependent sorry all the various environments that are could be running on you, they want to ensure that your packages is, is operational yeah. is there any requirement of validation or objective evidence from the developer to submit saying that I did clear all of these checks. Um, I didn't know if that was a, a step in this process or not. Um, you do. Um, you can, if, if there's a valid reason for you ignoring one of the notes or something like that, that come mm -hmm. up with our command check, then um, you can put an argument in your, submission to say so I, I remember reading about um one of the kind of um it, it's like a data set of of the 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 content of like the bronte books or something like that okay. and um they struggled to get it on initially because there's non-standard non utf8 characters or something like that in the oh, uh, uh, text yep but to modify the text such that it did have just utf8 characters it's something like this anyway they would have had to have mutilated the text yes. as you know as it was written yep. so rather than do that they just put in an argument that you know the, the why it should be allowed on cram despite failing a couple of checks but yeah it's it's rare that they will consider uh things that uh, sorry i don't mean to go on but like no that's okay pretty demanding but yeah but typically if it's for an app that's being deployed on a um 
uh, on a web server or something like that. Trying to submit to CRAM f- feels like overkill, really, for for a lot of for for that to me. Um, but uh, it, it but certainly when you're if you're if you're developing a package and you have a shiny app embedded in it as a way to illustrate how to use your package. I can understand that, yeah. but um, as a, to, to publish a standalone app where it's unlikely that anyone would extend your work in, in other ways, uh, it, it seems, seems a surprising venue to try and publish mm. your work, but I'm sure people well, do do it then. No, and that's that's ultimately why I was I was actually curious on development of your own uh, R Studio package server, so that mm. you're just pointing at a different mirror, uh, not yeah. not sidestepping anybody, but just being able to test to validate that yes, I can submit it to a mirror and then pull it back down again. That's a uh, uh, one of the uh, I, I guess test functions, right? You yeah, want to yeah. make sure that it can actually pass the criteria of these of these different validation yeah, points yeah. Uh, scrolling down further we have this de- uh, again another chapter on deploying the app um, the other way is is um, let's see uh, deploying to a, a web server so instead of the intended audience the person that you're you're working with your collaborators or, or users of your app instead of them uh, uh, requiring the loading of the package and then running the the app the shiny app directly from their environment, you just point it to a web server. Now there's three different ways in which this, this call is made. The first one is your RStudio Connect, which would be the enterprise grade paid service, commercial grade service. There is a shiny IO, which is also the common in here is it's a freemium uh, type system. Let me scroll down a bit. Yeah. Uh, they list the Shiny IO as a freemium. Um, if you want the free version, you only get one app, I believe. And then I think it's three three packages, but only one can be deployed at a given point. If you pay a service, then you can use the Shiny IO as a web server uh, to upload to. And then the, fin- the final one, uh, and by the way, these are not in order uh, of, the, uh, of the list here. And that's why it, it started to drive me nuts with the way the bullets were written versus the, uh, the way the... Uh, the uh, uh, dev uh, three uh, R package was written, uh, sorry, R file was written. The uh, shiny IO, the shiny, uh, sorry, uh, R studio connect. And then here's the third option. And this is where I enter this particular mix with my own personal shiny server. So again, being that I've created this, this, uh, this web server, similar to a Shiny IO or uh, uh, similar to an RStudio Connect. I have my own deployable application where I can interact with the web server on my own intranet. Um, If I did uh, uh, extend that out to the outside world and and have a, a, uh, what's that word? It's not an A-list, it's a uh, like a DNS, like you're paying a service for the world to come into your home. Um, I could potentially, you know, be able to deploy this to other users. And this is really where the, the, the uh, magic comes in to being able to do this. Yeah. So what you're going to do is you've got three calls in this. And I'm going to switch back over to the RStudio session real quick. Uh, that is here. Okay. Uh, within these calls, pull this down. We have either the Golem add RStudio connect file the Golem add shiny apps IO file or the Golem add shiny server file. Now, what I wanted to comment on, and I don't want to sound in any form disparaging towards anybody. It's actually just my uh, own interface with RStudio and some of the commercial services of RStudio. So just be very careful. I'm not trying to be opinionated here. Mm. Is you have three ways of deployment or three ways of, of creating this web server output side. When you run any one of these three, what it's going to do is create this apps R package. There's another file that is also incorporated, and I don't think it's here. I think it's in one of these. I think it's in R. This dis- uh, disable autoload R. Uh, there's two files that are generated. I don't know if I can make that screen larger. Uh, it may be difficult for the uh, viewers later to see this, but um, let me go back up. So I'm going to open this app R file real quick and just show you what it's doing. So yeah, that color is not the greatest. 
you have launched the Shiny app and it says, do not remove this comment. Uh, to deploy, run RS Connect and then deploy app or use the blue button at the top of this list. Okay, fair enough. So what they're asking us to do is either run this RS Connect, which is a package you are required to load this. Uh, it's a way or a pipeline to be able to install or, or lob your, your package, excuse me, load your Shiny app server global uh, files over to this other web server, okay? The difficulty I had with this is it only comments on the Shiny IO and the uh, RStudio Connect versions. So the other option that said, use the blue button and what they're referring to is this mm. publishing applications uh, option. If we open this, um, I've already got a, a Shiny IO account, but if you had multiple accounts, uh, they would be listed here. The point is that you only get these two options. Uh, let me do it a different way. Uh, let me see if I can Asset manage accounts. Where's that publishing piece at? I'm looking for the page where it only has the two options. Let me see if I can run, see if it'll pull it up this way. Uh, in terminal. And let's see, so it's bundling the package and I wanna see if it's gonna pop up the window that says push the, push the application. Yeah, it may already be deploying to my, to my Shiny IO account. Yeah, I think this is done non-interactively, the, the okay. deployment. Well, what I, was, what I was trying to show on the window, there's two options. There's either RStudio Connect or there's uh, Shiny IO. Those are the only two options you get. There isn't a third UI mm. option to deploy it to a local server. And that in, in itself is where this started to break down for me. I couldn't figure out a way that I could point at a particular URL or a you know FTP link, SFTP link or something that I could push my files over to the Shiny server directly. That is ultimately where this started to, to fail on me. When I tried to do the remote pull uh, or remote load, uh, it will install the package on my current RStudio environment because this is a web server. I can't actually activate the Shiny app. So there's no way I can get over to the Shiny side. Okay. So here's what I ended up doing. I'm gonna, yeah, I was gonna say, this is probably gonna error out. Um, so what, what, I, what I ended up doing was reverting back to my older method. And I wrote a note to myself that said, oh, I think I figured it out. I could just upload it to GitLab and then go to my web server and say, you know, get clone, here's my repo path, and then pull all the files back down to the location of the web server. Where I ran into problems there was because it's a web server, I don't have direct user access to it. Um, I had to deploy the sudo option. So let me show you this on terminal real quick, um, where we're going here. So right now I'm currently just in my, my own environment, but let's do a, uh, um, username at IP address. Okay, and then password. Okay, so once I access the web server, no, nope, didn't like the password. Oh, I know, I'm using the wrong password. It's the uh, bane of having too many different uh, uh, environments, uh, uh, operating systems. You have different passwords for different services. So I always forget which one to use. The, uh, now that I'm inside the Shiny server, um, I can go to the location where I have the Golem app uh, or the Golem package. So let's do a directory uh, and then CD. It was under Golem Shiny dash example. So uh, clear the screen and run the LS again. There we go. So inside here, obviously, I'm listing out all of the various names that I have in the current web RStudio environment. All I'm doing is just accessing the same folders. Now I'm, I'm coming in from a tunneling process or, a, or an SSH, secure shell process. Okay. So if I wanted to see my uh, app, for example, I could do a cat 
app.r. And that's going to show me the exact same process that I have when I was in the R studio side. Mm. All I'm trying to get at is that you can do all of this from command line if needed, but I still can't satisfy the need of, of, of passing it over to the server's side. So I had to stop with the package end of this. I did want to at least show you that I was able to deploy a, a uh, shiny server uh, uh, app.r and server, or sorry, is it ui.r and server.r um, scripts into the shiny server and were able to interact with the, with the, uh, the shiny app. I just mm. can't do it from a package management side. So here's where I'm posing the question to any user or any person is how do I actually get from my web R studio side? And then I pass over to my same server, just now R studio side, uh, different ports, same machine, just two different instances. So to do this, what I end up going after, and, and this is now we're gonna get into kind of how the structure of the shiny web server works. So I'm gonna go to SRV. And you'll notice that under the, the server directory, we have this second directory called shiny server. So CD shiny server, blitz directory. And you can see I've got a bunch of applications that I've put up here before. Yeah. I did try to create the golem shiny dash example. And I, this directory name is arbitrary. You can call it whatever you want. Uh, it's just the contents and what you're putting into it are important. And that's the, the, uh, the deployment uh, pipeline that I'm working with here. Okay, so if I go into Golem, there's not gonna be anything in there because I wasn't able to actually physically load it over. What I did end up doing is just doing a copy command. And that's not technically appropriate if you're talking in a package management type form, you want a lot of yeah. automation for this deployment. Um, there is a statement in the document. I'm gonna go back to the web server for just a brief moment. And there's a point in here where they talk about passing it over to an IT department. Maybe it's not in this chapter, but it's, it's another forum that I was reading. One of the options would be to uh, deploy it within your infrastructure, your IT infrastructure, and then you would have some other IT person load up to the server. Well, that's probably what they're doing is this CP command, or I have to believe that that's exactly what they're doing. So you're the developer, you've packaged your, your GZ file, for example, you've passed it over to your IT department, the IT department extracts it and then loads the UI and server up to the, up to the web. Possibly is how I'm going about this. Let me finish this statement and then I'll get into the Docker side here in just a second. So going back to terminal, what I ended up doing is just doing a, a, a CP directly. And if I go through my history here, you'll notice yeah. I have the copy command. There it is. So what I'm doing is obviously evoking a super user. I have to elevate my credentials to be able to access that web server side. Uh, the user, my R Metcalf account, doesn't have direct read write access to that uh, or execute access to that, that service. So I have to elevate credential then I'm just making a CP call. CP is copy. I am doing a revert, uh, recursive call. So I want all the contents in this particular directory that I'm pointing at to upload to this other service. And the way you wanna read this particular copy function, if anybody's ever used this before, is the path in which your current content lives. And then the second argument is, where do you wanna put that content? So again, I'm I'm on the same server, I'm on the same uh, session. I just need to pass it from one side to another side. So where does the files live? And then where are you putting the files? That's how you wanna read this. So I'm going from my home directory, R Metcalf, deploy shiny break, and then shiny example. I'll show you this package here in a second. And then I'm passing it over to the server side, shiny server, and then shiny example. Yeah. Does that make sense? Uh-huh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so um, um, so you, you would choose to copy the files rather than to link from your home directory. I could That's do a set a link, link from the server directory into your home directory. Yes, that, that actually would be, that's, that's a, uh, a statement in the document. 
Um, it doesn't call it symlink, but that's ultimately what you're doing. You would just want to make sure that the server's side has uh, read, write, execute, I believe. Am I saying mm. that right? Or is it read, yeah, 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 yeah. read and execute? You don't want write you don't want write ability no. on a web server. I think it's no. just read and execute. Um, is that 755? Is that the, the numbering sequence of read, write, execute that you want on a web server? Either way, the uh, you could create a sim link and then just link back to where your RStudio web services are storing the files. Um, that is one comment they make here. Uh, but the statement, I don't know where that sentence is. Uh, the solution is common choice to companies that have strict security policies. That's where I was talking about giving it to the IT department and then letting them upload it. Um, it's down here at the bottom. What I'm being critical about or what I'm trying to post to anybody that may watch this video or have any questions, feel welcome to uh, call me, uh, text me, anything. Um, the one-click deployment or the uh, package load uh, didn't work for the necessity that I had. So yeah. what yeah. I was toying with the idea is, do I need to create some additional arguments in this particular call to say, go to this IP address, <clears throat> create an SFTP link, uh, pass credential, and then load it to this directory. Or just like what you had stated, Russ, is being able to do a direct sim link where the the contents of the file are in a protected area that our studio is, is writing and accessing, the web server can just link with it and, and only hit have read and execute ability. I believe that would be the better option, especially in this uh, use case of having both servers on one hardware. Yeah. So, you, but your server, is, it, um, it's, not, it's not something you'd consider be, be, um, uh, pre presumably you could could you push to your server from a, a GitLab um, CI script you could if or you had that... the credentials no yeah, you could yeah. if you had the credentials and that's uh, if I go up a little bit further you'll see that when I was trying to do the get clone option it wasn't working um, Yeah, I, I'm, I'm going to probably have to go through quite a bit of history to find it um, uh, no, nope. I was looking at log files because my previous application was failing on me and I was trying to figure out why. Uh, let's see. I want to do a pseudo get. That's what I'm looking for. Uh, is that it? Mm, no, that's still a copy. Uh, anyway, there we go. There we go. So here in this particular call, what I was attempting to do was within the web server side of this service. Remember that my credential, my, my user credential, our Metcalf, doesn't have uh, right access to this. Mm. So that what I would need to do is elevate credential. So that's where sudo comes in. Yeah, 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 then yeah. I would evoke get and then try to clone from a repository. So I'm just pulling the files down to this web service. Yeah. Is that answering your question? Yeah, 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 of course, yeah, yeah. What I would need uh, to do is grant the root user or the pseudo super user, I would have to create another security certificate with my GitLab rep uh, repository to allow the service to pull that down because that's mm -hmm. a more privileged, uh, it's not privileged rights, what's the word I'm looking for? Being able to to uh, create a, a Git repository in a, a, uh, a web service type application. If I tried to do this, you'll see what ends up failing here. I'll just try and run it. Uh, All right, so I get a Git clone permission denied public key keyboard interactive fatal could not read the remote repository. Well, it's not mm. because I don't have the credential. I just don't have the credential as root. Yeah, so my SSH yeah, yeah. key doesn't match the current super user that I'm elevated to. I have it for R Metcalf. I don't have it for root. And I don't think this is a really good plan to ever, ever follow. No, no. So especially on a web server, a public facing mm -hmm. web server, 
I wouldn't want to follow this path. There is a forum. I can uh, pull it back up and link it, send it to you. It's in my browser history, but um, there was a method to do this. It wasn't something I wanted to deploy because it was outside of our studio. It was outside of the automation. It, it was more of kind of a, uh, it does the same Semlink uh, executable process that you would have uh, previously explained. Um, I didn't want to go that route because it was foreign to the automation of what Golem and, and package management does as a whole. So, okay. yeah. Where I'm going to go back to the browser now is, uh, uh, let me do one more thing before I get to the Docker. So just to show you that I do have an active service, uh, I went and grabbed just the common vanilla uh, uh, shiny app, the uh, uh, old faithful uh, shiny app that's in, in the uh, uh, shiny package and just deployed that as a UI.R and a server.R. By doing that copy command and then pulling it from my RStudio side into my, my uh, uh, shiny server side, um, I can be able to interact with this. It does work. It, all the shiny features that we were expecting in the code to operate, it does work. And if you notice my URL, it's the same uh, IP address of my server, but now I'm interacting on port 3838. So the, the, the whole end of this, and just so everyone else can laugh at my funny URL pass here, when I created a uh, breakpoint, uh, I named it shiny example, the same directory. What it ended up doing was uh, folding it into another URL with the same name. So if it, that's just me being funny, I, I realized what I did there. And uh, so if you ever go to a URL and you see like, you know, 20 uh, folded names of almost the same thing, you know that somebody is just using an automated service to generate it. <laughs> at any rate. Um, if we want to go check this out, I can go back to my terminal or we can do this from our studio as well. But um, let me go cd dot dot uh, back up one level list directory and then here's my shiny example so cd shiny example and then there's my uh, nested folder shiny example again and then app is server and ui dot r so this is where we're getting the old faithful shiny app from okay the final final statement in this in this chapter, in this exercise as deployment will be to dockerize <clears throat> your application. Now, at an early stage yesterday afternoon or, or mid evening, um, I was attempting to generate the hex make think R package, um, mm -hmm. be able to deploy that as a shiny app what I ran into was a whole host of different dependency issues. And then one of the biggest difficulties was you needed a MongoDB, uh, actually MongoDB Lite, uh, Docker container to store your HexMake material in. When I was attempting to deploy this in a, in a, in a very large kind of infrastructure, I didn't have all those additional resources. So it's not a, it, it's okay to run a Docker container locally on your machine or even on a on another server. Uh, do the YAML call to to generate. What I ran into is a whole host of other difficulties uh, in in full deployment. So I said, okay, let's pause on the hex make. Let's back up and just try like baby names. Uh, Mr. Hadley Wickham had uh, put together a shiny app for interacting with the uh, the. Uh, is it social security or, or some agency that uh, manages baby names? Yeah. Uh, and so they publish and, and it's a common, uh, a common tool to interact with uh, using Shiny. That one, I had difficulty with uh, managing the data itself. So where do I put the chunk that I access and then compile the CSV file that's ingested into Shiny and then you can interact with? That was a another barrier of workflow that I, I was running into time constraints with. Um, my point where I'm going with this Docker container side is you can generate using either a Docker file, the Shiny proxy or Heroku uh, forms of, of Docker container 
package management. So going back to our, our studio session, excuse me, there we go. And going back to our uh, deployment, you have either create a Docker file, create a Shiny proxy or create a Heroku file. I haven't tried these. I don't know what it will produce. Let's just try this Docker file version. Um, it talks about, it takes a snapshot of your current RStudio environment. So all of the yeah. dependencies, all of the uh, RStudio environment, all the packages that are loaded currently to run the app, et cetera, that creates a particular Docker, Docker YAML file. So let's do a control run and see what this produces. Uh, please wait while we're computing system requirements. <laughs> And now that we're done, I'm looking for a file here. So this is now called Docker file. It's at the very bottom of you. There we go. So if we look at this file in our, our studio session, yeah, it's a common run and add commands all the way across this whole service. So Frederica, when we were talking about uh, package management version control, or maybe it was Russ, one of your uh, session deliveries, uh, we got into a discussion about Docker as a service. Docker is the future of, of web development or just serverless computers. It's, it's the whole idea of cloud computing and those are all buzzwords. But mm -hmm. when you're calling on Docker, it is instantiating or creating this, this uh, machine, right? It's either a Linux machine or it's a Windows machine. You can't have both. Um, but you're creating this, this environment, what this YAML call is doing or this Docker uh, file is doing is giving instructions to a Docker package management to pull and then combine everything together to create your Shiny app inside a Docker container. Okay, let's do just a quick uh, Google search real fast. And I think if I go to Docker Hub, I think I do I have to log in? To make this work or can i search without logging in i think you can search on yeah. uh let's just try this and do shiny so what all of these different shiny apps are doing or users they're creating their own shiny app using a docker call possibly with package management golem as a service mm -hmm. creating this this uh uh, instructions. And so the instructions, if you were to run these, I can spin up Docker if you're wanting to see how this all works. But what you're doing is, is creating this, this, I don't want to use the word virtual. It's, it's, uh, it's a hyper V, uh, running on top of your machine. Um, if you're on windows, or if you're on Mac, you have to use Docker desktop. If you're on Linux, Russ, I think you were talking about this over a weekend. You said you yeah, literally yeah. ran out of system resources because <laughs> oh it, yeah, it drained me straight up. out. Yeah. Um, when you're creating these Docker containers, obviously it's extending into another uh, uh, resource on your laptop, and it is better suited. If I can give a recommendation to any user, would be run this on Linux. It's a little bit more intuitive to what you're doing. If you are inside your uh, Docker desktop on a Mac or on a Windows computer, there's some other details that have to be managed as well. And to do a time check, I'm three minutes before closure. Uh, do you want me to show you anything else or interact with anything else? Um, I don't know, it's, it's quite interesting. I mean, there's so, there's so many options to do the, the things and um so so you were using your your web server has shiny server installed on it doesn't it and that's the that's thing right. that you were trying to because i i found um and um oh sorry i've lost it now um i did find a um an, an overview of how one of the CRAN packages, oops, uh, hold on to everyone, um, how um, there's a particular CRAN package that's a, a Shiny app, and it has details of how they set up Shiny server and Nginx and things like that in order to deploy their app on one of, of their own servers. It's quite a useful um, well, 
at the yeah. bottom of that deployment piece, Russ, did they do just a direct SEM link or is it within the package that actually in, sends it? Uh, here, they are um, creating it from GitHub, I think. I think okay. they're, yeah, I think they're pulling down to the server. Um, yeah. Um, hmm. Yeah. Yeah, I'm not sure. Um, well, I did want to show you that I do have both the uh, server UI and the, sorry, server R and UI R. I do have these files on the same repository. If you would want to clone this, it's private currently, but I mean, if if we were to, to try and clone it, where I was running into that barrier was the elevated user credential of working within that shiny yeah, server. Yeah, yeah folder and then not having the right uh, uh not having the right credential the ssh key yeah. to interact with the repository so the forum that i was going to post or the, the session url that i was going to post there was i think it's a hacker noon or hack or something site but they were showing you how you could deploy a, a web server from git or using git and the point was that your storage folder would be outside and then you would sim link back to your your uh, web service yeah and if any person if any user is ever wanting to know more information about sim links think of it as like the wormhole awesomeness of linux um, your 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 content is living in a different directory it's not a hyperlink but you're you're kind of passing user credentials this uh, read and execute only not write ability uh, but still to a directory outside of that uh, point. Uh, let me go back to my terminal real quick and I'll just show you what I'm referring to. So uh, let's do uh, get back to Shiny server. Okay, clear the screen. So get rid of all the funniness so I can show you exactly what I'm talking about. When you look at these two kind of lighter blue colors, if you're ever in a terminal or you have the ability of color, um, one of the, the points is that this service will uh, change or highlight different colors of, of, of file types or uh, directories or file types. This lighter blue color indicates that it's a sim link. And uh, I don't remember the command to tell you where it's pointing at. Uh, there's a way that you can do an LS command, yeah. but then it also uh, tells you what the sim links are. It's not an AL. Um, oh, maybe that is it. Okay, so here, if you're reading, this has read, write, executable features to root user. And then it says the index.html is actually in my opt shiny server samples welcome HTML file. Or the sample apps is pointing at opt shiny server samples sample apps. So what, what I'm trying to state here is this opt point is outside of your web server call, but because it's sim linked, it is able to access those files. Yeah. You can't do this in Windows. That's ultimately what I was trying to get at is, is sim links were kind of a, it was a mind blowing uh, point in my career, uh, early, early stages of learning uh, where I discovered what sim links were. And then I tried to do it on Windows and it actually laughed at me. So <laughs> there's a way that you can mount it, but it's, it's a different, different uh, sequence. It's not actually a sim link. But at any rate. Um, so there was a tool mentioned shiny proxy uh, in the the files in the the docker thing um, so that the shiny proxy does something akin to what uh nginx or a apache server does is that correct it's sort of a, a, a redirection of incoming um... i didn't i didn't try the proxy call uh, on the r studio session that would yeah. be let's close that out real quick um there is a way of generating a proxy call let's just see what this looks like um, again i don't know how long this will take this is mm, a little bit yeah, of a yeah, yeah. resource constrained server but um so it looks like that's really hard to read like that. Uh, let me see if I can put it here instead. 
Uh, let's go back to home directory. And go to my boy training. Yeah, that's, that's what it is. I think that's what it is. Uh, I did like that. Oh, sorry, you had two CDs. There you go. Yeah. And yes, this is the right one. So let's, uh, no, it's not. It was the golem. Uh, let's see. Okay, and then we wanted to look at, it wasn't, was it Dockerfile? I that think it created? was a Dockerfile that got updated. Uh, just checking real quick. Yes, okay. I was trying to display it to the screen a little bit easier. Uh, let's see, I want to do a cat. And then let's zoom in closer. Not too close. Right. But all, all, sorry, but all of, all of this comes from your knowledge, or because it's not this is not mentioned in the book how to de deal with within the terminal this way. No, that's because, correct. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. The, the the book the book isn't lacking. The book assumes that you already have knowledge of how to do this type of service. Um, Docker as a as a as a community or Docker as a, a learning the new serverless computer co concept, you would need to have a good familiarity of DevOps or, or just being able to have a very strong understanding of Linux in general, Unix in general, to really harness the concepts of what you're doing. In a nutshell, Docker is nothing more than CH root uh, or, or SCH root, which is, is the secure version of it. Um, but what you're doing is, is setting up uh, namespace variable changes within your Linux kernel. Uh, that's how that hypervisor concept works. Um, you can actually change the version of Linux that you're running so that you can do something else with it if you had Docker running. Um, it's more native to a Linux computer, and that's why I mentioned it's a little bit easier if you didn't have Linux. Um, if you're on Mac or if you're on Windows, you need this hypervisor manager, which is the Docker desktop. Um, there are some weird dependency things that happen. It works. It can be used on, on other utilities. Um, I don't want to contest that with any person uh, in the future. You can run Docker desktop and, and do all of the things that we're showing here. Um, if you were to deploy it on a Linux server, Docker runs a little bit easier. Uh, it's, it's more native. So, but to go back and answer uh, Russ's question, I believe what we're doing here is calling a pandoc that I guess generates the Docker file. Um, we're echoing options, pointing at CRAN, listing all of our packages, making a directory build zone, remotes install local upgrade never, and expose 3838. This probably does work Russ, but it almost appears that it might be just generating a Docker web server and okay. then adding the commands into it to expose yeah. 3838 with all of your features. Yeah. One thing I was thinking was that perhaps you could make a... Now, I can never remember which one's which. So there's... I think it's a Docker image. Yes. Within which... So within which your app has already been um, loaded, which mm -hmm. you could perhaps pull from your, the server side of your, so the web server side of your thing from, I, I don't know, but that, I guess that makes. Well, what, pre no, 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 you're, you're, you're answering the right, you're, you're going down the right path. The way I would approach that would be if I generate my own Docker image, and I want to host it or post it to my own Docker registry. I do have my own Docker registry. Um, I could upload it there. Then from within, uh, you wouldn't call it from the web server's side because you would want to generate it oh, okay. directly. But from our studio, you could call on Docker registry, pull the image back down, create the container within your session, and then it would have your web server inside there. 
um, that's a it's 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 by wrapping it into the Docker side of things, you're not you're creating kind of like almost a a Node.js server or a, Dej a Django uh, Python server, uh, you know the shiny server concept. You're creating this this web socket or web service to interact with that would be local to your machine. Yeah. That's where you get the URL one twenty seven zero zero one and then some port ID. Um, okay. That the, right. the host, if you'd want to yeah, change yeah. this, I guess the host IP, you could probably uh, manage. You may have to add some more details to that for it to work. Yeah, but yeah. anyway. Okay, cool. This is uh, deployment is uh, not an area of the world that I am uh, familiar overly with. familiar with, to be well, honest. And I, and, uh, uh, I think from an it's, so it was very interesting to see you yeah. kind of take us through the uh, yeah. options for that that are presented in the chapter. Uh, I, I I found it uh, ironic, I guess, that at every option I kept hitting some level of barrier, and that's where I come back to the very beginning statement of I don't know if I'm the only person doing this. I doubt that. Yeah. That's actually a very egotistical comment or <laughs> the other option is i'm just not thinking about it the right way and there's other more efficient tools to do it with and that's probably the the, the uh it is the more optimal path to follow um, if you were to step into there the fact that we have six to seven different ways of deployment of the app tells me i'm not thinking about this right or i'm not uh i'm not incorporating it the right way yeah at any rate okay yeah i'll I'll have a think about it. I've not really played around with these kind of things much, and I, I, I possibly run a local one and experiment. Anyway, thanks ever so much for um, taking us through it. Uh, Federica's headed off. Um, yes, uh, so next week um, we um, will probably be talking about optimization of one form or another. Um, so uh yes uh brilliant um but yeah i'll uh, I tr i'll try and um post some things in the slack channel to if i if i do experiment with this but it's, yeah it's very interesting cool anyway it's been good to see you again um thank I'll, you I'll, I'll, yeah we'll uh speak again uh next week this is uh, yeah we're getting pretty close to the end of the book okay yeah, great sir i'll talk to you soon thank you sir okay <laughs> see All you right. later bye bye, -bye.